Hey everybody, uh, Chief Meteorologist Steve Templeton here. Welcome to Steve's Storm School from the Home Office. Uh, every Wednesday we've been doing this so that uh, kids who are getting homeschooled can kind of quench their thirst if you have a little curiosity about weather. Uh, that's why we're here. And I'll open it up to general questions in a second. Um, I'll start off with a, a little uh, example about radar, a real life example actually, that happened last night. And then uh, we'll open it up. I'll have some pictures and videos to help explain some of these uh, science concepts. Uh, just tell me your, your kid's name and age, William, who's age nine. Um, and I'll give you some shout outs throughout our Facebook Live. Uh, and I'll also uh, give you a shout out on your age and name as you ask a question. Before we get started, um, I thought I'd just kind of show you around the place. Uh, let me see here. So this is what I'm doing. I have uh, my laptop here hooked up to a bigger screen so you can see that. Uh, this is my office, that's our world map. You'll see that behind me during uh, News 4. Those are, those are my kids' pictures. That's Seamus right there. My wife put some hockey art on the wall too. And then this is the setup, check this out. So that's a ring light, so that whole ring lights up. There's another light there. I don't know why, they just put it there. I just do what, I'm, what they say. Got a teddy bear on the window and looks like FedEx is here, by the way. Uh, and that's because <laughs> there's like a scavenger hunt for kids in the neighborhood. By the way, that phone, that's how we broadcast and it gets really hot. So I'm just looking into a phone, but I have a fan on it so it doesn't overheat. But that's, that's pretty much uh, my, my little setup here. Um, how about uh, John, who's age nine and a half? Let me get this thing set back up. Willie, who's age eight. So again, welcome to Steve Storm School. Um, I'm gonna start things off explaining a real life example of something that happened on radar last night. We had a tornado warning. Did we have a tornado? I don't think so. I haven't heard of any confirmed damage. And I'll explain why you can get a warning but not a uh, actual tornado in a second. Let me switch over. This is old radar data. This is last night. So again, this is not happening right now. Don't worry. But here's my cursor. Hopefully my cursor is big enough for you to see. There are actually two areas on the radar I was watching real closely. But see this little nub right here? I'm going to zoom in on it. So there's St. Louis right there. This line of storms is over in the Metro East. And it's right near Highland, Illinois. Actually, just south of Highland. There's Highland right there. Here's Trenton to the south. This, what we call a little nub. What's happening here is wind is actually rotating like this. And one of the reasons I know is I can look at the winds within the Doppler. See that bright red? What that's telling me is the winds are really strong gusting out here. So there's a potential anywhere along here for straight line wind damage. So that's a real strong wind gust. But then see that little green right there? That's where there's rotation. So the red represents raindrops. Let me clear that and I'll draw it again. The red represents raindrops that are going away from the radar. Again, this, is, this actually happened last night. This is what I was watching. The green represents rain, raindrops that are going towards the radar. And so what that signifies to me is rotation, right? In that little area right there. I'll play the radar loop. And you can, you'll see in this radar loop how there's nothing really strong until all of a sudden, boom, right there. One of the clues that something was happening is that we were starting to see a surge on radar right in this area here. And along a squall line, when you get a little surge, you look for the northern section to rotate. And so there indeed was a, and just fly be so, a, a tornado warning from the National Weather Service. And so we went on the air within, we told them exactly where it was, where it's going, did frequent updates as needed. I haven't heard of any or confirmed damage. So it's not necessarily that so that that actually did hit the ground. So what, what happened here? What's going on? There's our real life example of rotation and a tornado warning from last night. Again, that's old radar data, okay? Let's go to this. This is from the Good Friday tornado. I'll put it in presentation mode. Right over here is where the tornado's gonna be. Hey, Dakari, who's age two. I got a two-year-old on here. <laughs> Starting them young, I love it. Here's where the Doppler winds are helping us. I'll zoom in. Again, this is the Good Friday tornado, old radar data. Um, this is... Uh, the green, you see right there, raindrops going towards the radar. Red, raindrops going away. There's St. Anne, Bridgeton. So this is helping me pinpoint that that is where the rotation is. Now in this case, there was a tornado. So perfect. R radar actually helped 
tell us there is a, rate, there a tornado. But the problem is, radar's not perfect. You need to know that. Alvin Camus says, hi, KMOV. Hey there. So here's why radar is not perfect and why some folks ran for the basement and then came up and there was no tornado. And that's okay. It's okay. It's because radar does help save lives. But here's what radar does. It sends out a pulse, a little beam here, and uh, it bounces off the raindrops. But it has to go above the ground because if it went on the ground, it would hit buildings and schools and stuff like that. So this beam has to be up above, clear of any buildings. So that beam is actually sensing rotation up here in the storm. Perfect. Radar in this case sees rotation here. Turns out there's a tornado. It saves lives. Bob Brown says, hello, Steve. Um, hey there. And uh, here, radar sees rotation. Wait, whoa, 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 no tornado. Radar can't see the ground. This is rain, by the way. So this is air going up. This is air going down. If there was a tornado, it would be right here. What is going on? Well, radar sees up above the ground, and it can't tell the difference between this storm producing a tornado on the ground and this storm not producing a tornado on the ground. So if I go back to my real life example last night, radar is sensing rotation. I will tell you exactly how far away that was from the radar, by the way. Let me clear that. So this tool, I'm gonna to go from our radar, which is up here in Weldon Spring, and I'm gonna draw a line to where that rotation is. So the beam height is about 4,000 feet off the ground. That's what that says. It's hard to see, but that's what that says right there. Beam height, 4,000. Look, folks, radar isn't perfect. We always want to be transparent and honest with you because we don't want you running for the basement thinking there's a tornado. You come up, there isn't. You're wondering, what's going on? Why? I always run in the basement. There's nothing there. And next time when there's a tornado warning, you don't go to the basement. We don't want you doing that. Think about it like buckling up, like a seatbelt. You buckle up, not because you think you're going to be in an accident, but because it's the safe thing to do and the right thing to do. I buckle up all the time and I'm not in an accident, but I still buckle up. I hope that if you happen to be, and this is for very few people, very few times a year, sometimes no times a year, sometimes seven times a year, if you're one of the people that has to run to the basement because you're in that tornado warning, know that you're doing the right thing, but radar's not perfect. It may not necessarily produce a tornado. All right, let's get to some questions here. Hopefully you like that kind of real life example. There was a tornado warning and I've, I have heard of some damage, straight-lined wind damage from a couple storms, South City, Bismarck, Missouri, um, Muscoota, Scott Air Force Base. So there was definitely some straight-lined wind damage last night, by the way. All right. Uh, Alvin's from Hazelwood. Hey, Alvin. Let me get to some questions here. Hello from Danny Bowman, age nine, from Henry Elementary. What's up? He said that. What's up? Not me. Uh, hey, Henry. Amy Kerber's on here, one of our foreign storm spotters. He says Hi. Uh, all right, and Mr. Bob's Head Start Classroom. Um, Avery, age seven, wants to know if floods can hurt animals. Uh, great question. Um, so yes, it can, it can. Um, let me get to uh, some pictures of flooding and stuff. It can, but however, you know, animals have this innate ability to kind of know something's up, something's wrong. But uh, if they get caught, just like humans can get caught in a bad situation, um, I'll show you some flooding here. This is from Park Hills. You get, and how do you get this? You get too much rain in too short of time. Let me hit presentation and it'll play. Um, but, you know, let's say you're a rabbit and your home was in this little culvert area where underneath there there's grass. Yeah, it, it could be bad, but I'm telling you, they, they sense things and, and animals tend to know, and this is just my... Um, a non-scientific opinion on that. They, they tend to know uh, where to go. Here, here's, let me get to an example of how animals, because here's another question, Avery, can tornadoes hurt animals? Well, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> but I have a picture of some damage from homes in, like this one, from the Good Friday tornado. And um, there was a home that, like this, was just really destroyed and no one was home. <clears throat> no one got hurt. No, no one got uh, killed in the Good Friday tornado, by the way. People were prepared. They had ways to get the warnings. Um, but there, were, there was uh, two brothers I spoke to as I inspected some of the damage, and they said, well, that house across the street, that's our parents' house. They weren't home, but the two dogs were. Two dogs were home. The brothers came out of their house. They saw their parents' house, no roof, no walls, and walking up out of the basement, the two dogs. They survived. How did they know to go to the basement? because they were watching Channel 4. <laughs> All right, 
Hello, uh, Gavin9, Gia4, and Micah5, soon to be six. Happy early birthday to Micah, all from O'Fallon, Illinois, from the Smith family there. And uh, Travis9 and Jocelyn4, how do tornadoes start? Travis9 and Jocelyn4, curious about tornadoes. Good question. We're not 100% sure. Um, there's still a lot of science and studying that has to go into it. One of the reasons why it's hard to walk up to a tornado and measure it. Um, so the science of tornado genesis, the beginning of a tornado, has gotten a lot better. But basically there are ingredients. One of them is you need warm, moist air. Um, and then you need something to lift that warm, moist air up. That's why you hear that myth that cold air and hot air mixing creates a tornado. That's not true. Cold air and hot air mixing creates sometimes storms if you do have warm, moist air. It's an ingredient. It's kind of like baking a cake. You can't give someone flour and say, bake me a cake. No, I need sugar. I need eggs. I need an oven. So if you have warm, cold air hitting, that's that lift. And then you have the warm, moist air. That's another ingredient. The other thing you need is spin in the atmosphere. We call it shear because we like big, fancy words. Uh, in fact, I'll show you what shear kind of looks like here. We like big, fancy words in weather to make us sound smart. But if you, if you can see closely, the clouds are moving in two different directions. This layer is going this way, this layer is going this way. Top layer is going from right to left. So that's shear. Um, so there's an ingredient that could create a tornado. No tornadoes created in this video. So again, it's just an ingredient. So if you can get those ingredients together, you still might end up just getting what's called a supercell thunderstorm. And here's what a supercell thunderstorm looks like. This is a persistently rotating storm. The air is going up, 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 and it's rotating as it does. And if you look closely, you'll see this whole storm just spinning, no tornado. If there was a tornado, it'd be right about here. So let's say you get all those ingredients together. You've got that shear, you've got that warm, moist air, you've got a strong storm and uh, updraft and air's kicking up because cold air, cold fronts come in hitting that warm front, uh, warm air that is, and you've got this spinning storm. Well, where's, where's our tornado? Turns out, about three out of four of those, those spinning storms, don't produce uh, a tornado, those supercells. Um, and one out of four do. And we're not exactly sure why. We think it has something to do with the way that the storm tightens and stretches up. Um, it's kind of like, the tightening part is kind of like when a figure skater spins around and they stick out their arms. That was the worst example of spinning. What was that? Um, <laughs> they stick out their arms and they spin around and then they bring their arms in and they spin faster. That's the conservation of angular momentum and something in the atmosphere does that. It takes the spin and tightens it, brings it in a little closer to the axis of spin and that makes it go a little faster. So we, we have some clues, some ideas, but it, it's really hard to measure and figure out. Tornado start. Ingredients. Um, are tornadoes most common in St. Charles? No, not really. Um, we, we get tornadoes all over the metro. Think of tornadoes as uh, like darts. So like the state of Missouri gets, I think it's something like 35 to 40 on average uh, tornadoes per year. That's the whole state. Um, so let's say I gave you 40 darts per year and just said throw them at the state. Most likely they're going to hit farmland. Uh, rarely are they going to hit a city. And then when they do hit cities, um, in our area, it's happenstance. So if you have two tornadoes in St. Charles in, in one year, don't think that you're some kind of magnet for tornadoes. It's just a coincidence. Now, remember I said that tornadoes happen because of these ingredients coming together? Turns out the United States is the tornado capital of the world. 49 out of 50 tornadoes around the world happen in the United States. And of course, in the United States, they happen generally in the Midwest, the South, um, the Central Plains. They can happen in any state. Uh, but they usually happen in kind of the middle and southern part of the United States. Why? Appalachian Mountains here, Rocky Mountains here. Right in between, relatively flat. So cold air from Canada, warm moist air from the Gulf of Mexico can easily collide. No mountains in the way to stop or impede them. So you can get those ingredients, one of the ingredients, that warm moist air colliding with the uh, cold air from Canada, but there's also a jet stream that comes through and adds that shear. We had some shear uh, yesterday, by the way, and so we had an environment where we thought, well, you know, an isolated brief tornado would be possible. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, Susan Klingenberg Craig wants to know, how do clouds form? So let's start with what, what are clouds? Clouds are water, it's just water. Uh, little droplets of water that are so light they don't, <laughs> fall to the ground as rain. 
So they just float. Trillions and trillions of them. Now, it's not always liquid water. Sometimes they're ice crystals. And if you ever look up and you see, it, it feels like a bright day, but it's kind of, you look up and it's a milky white sky. It's kind of wispy. You can see through the cloud. Usually those are glaciated, meaning they're all made of ice. We call those cirrus clouds. So how does that happen? You've got to take moisture from near the ground and lift it up. Have you ever heard of thermal? The ground heats up, the air near the ground heats up, the air starts rising. You will literally see the air rising because as it goes up, the water that's in the air will start to condense into little droplets and form a cloud. So that's exactly what's happening there. Air is going up and the water in the air is condensing into water droplets or freezing into little icicles. So essentially what you've done is you've taken warm, moist air and you've lifted it up where it's colder. You can do that in the wintertime usually. When you go and you make a brief cloud and eventually it moves around and dissipates it because it evaporates. But what you're doing is you're taking warm, moist air and putting it into cold air. So what the atmosphere does is it takes warm air near the ground and it has to lift it up to get to the cold air. That's how clouds form. All right, um, Braxton who's six, Erica, who's four, is it true the arch con can control weather? Um, no. No, it's not. I was going to make a joke about it, but no, because that's just a persistent myth. Um, not that I know of, unless there's some kind of secret scientific plan uh, that, that I don't know about. No, it's not. No, the, the arch is beautiful, gorgeous. It's been struck by lightning several times. Don't think things only get struck by lightning once. The arch has been struck by uh, one storm multiple times. Um, but no, it doesn't control weather. Here's what happens. Some people think, um, oh, the storm split and it missed us because of the arch. Or the storm split and missed us because I live in a valley. Or the storm split and it missed us because I live near a river. What you're seeing is um, you're seeing the storm split and you're remembering it. So your perception is something happened there to create that. But it's not something like topography or geography. Remember, storm is up above. It's not really affected by um, hills. It would be affected by huge mountains, but not really affected by hills or valleys or the arch. The arch is minuscule compared to a 50,000 tall uh, storm cloud. So those storm clouds could care less about the buildings or the arch. They're not affected by it. So don't think because you live near a river you can't get hit by a tornado. You most certainly can, absolutely. Um, and so People have this perception, though, when you see a storm split, you think, oh, I can't be hit. You remember that. But you don't remember the times where you were hit by the storm, and it didn't split. Um, Gavin, who, uh, Gavin Smith, wants to know, are the ice crystals in the clouds during the summer? That's a great question. I love that. So he was listening to my explanation about clouds. What are they made of? Water droplets and sometimes ice crystals. Yes, um, during the summertime, the storms actually get even taller because there's more heat to drive them taller. And the higher up you go, the colder it is. You think of a mountain, it's brown, 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 and then all of a sudden there's snow at the top. So the higher up you go, it's colder, right? So if you can thrust that water higher up, it's going to be colder. And not only will there be ice crystals, but there's probably a lot of hail in summertime thunderstorms that you never see. And that's because, and hail, by the way, is a chunk of ice. But those chunks of ice, as they fall, sometimes they melt into big raindrops. And a lot of times our heavy summertime thunderstorms were our big raindrops that used to be hail. So it's raindrops and hail up above, they fall and all the hail melts and then it's just big plops of raindrops. So um, great, great question though. So even if it's hot in here near the surface, remember the higher up you go, the colder it is. Um, how do shelf clouds form from uh, Amy? She wants to know uh, how shelf clouds form. I saw one last night. Cool, yeah, let me show, let me go back to that radar and explain why you saw that last night too. So, again, this is old radar. This is not happening now, but uh, I was using this at the beginning to explain uh, a tornado warning. Uh, but see the leading edge of this line right here? That produces a shelf cloud usually. And uh, that's because you have the cool air. You know when you get hit by a thunderstorm, you get that cool air? The cool air, which is right here, is colliding with the warm air that I'm putting for W. And as that happens, the warm air gets lifted up. And that creates a cool looking shelf cloud. Let's see, uh, I know I've got an example here from our friend Daryl Herzman. 
Um, let's see here. That's Tornil. That is. This is from my quiz last week, by the way. I still have some slides from a. If you want to look at the Facebook, live Facebook Storm School from last week, uh, we have a quiz there. So this is going to be a shelf cloud, and this is what it looks like. So what's happening here is from the left, you're going to get rain, and out ahead of the rain, you have cool air. So there it is really quick. Don't worry, I'm going to slow it down. That's it, right there. That's the shelf cloud. So you have really cool air from the rain. Rain's back over here, but the cool air's out ahead of it. Kind of like when you spill milk, it splatters outwards. Well, the, the cool air is splattering outwards, and then it's hitting the warm air, and it's lifting it up right here. And that's creating this cloud. Sorry for using my fingers, but hopefully that explains it. But bottom line is, you're witnessing the interface of inflow. Inflow is warm, moist air going like this into the storm. And outflow, outflow is the cool air that rushes out of the storm. And it manifests itself. Manifest is a word that means it shows itself. You can visibly see it. It manifests itself in the form of a shelf cloud. Great question. Uh, let's see, Elliot, who's five? Cool, thanks for being on here, Elliot. Thank you for doing this for the kids. My pleasure. My stepdad has chased storms before. That's awesome. Hopefully he's trained and knows what he's doing. Um, what is, where did that go? What, my said is just, what, what's your favorite kind of storm to monitor? So I don't like storms. Um, I mean, they're fascinating, but you know, from my perspective, storms can hurt people. Even last night, it was a, a low, but it's still a chance of an isolated tornado, but I was more worried about wind damage, you know, and like a tree coming down on somebody's home or car. Um, so I don't, it's not that I like to monitor potentially tornadic or severe storms, but I do know that's when I'm needed. Um, and so my training of how to communicate, because that's a lot of what I do, I'm a science communicator. So I understand science, but I'd like to think I understand how to communicate that to people. So my training, how to read the radar, how to communicate, isn't important if it's sunny and 70. You've got an app for that. So it's not that I like severe weather, but I know that I'm needed and I can be helpful. Um, and so I feel like I can help the community. So that's really, uh, I don't want to call it my favorite, you know, storm to monitor, but it's when I know I'm needed and all the training and hard work I put into understanding storms and radar can be put to use. Linda York, uh, Nashville, Illinois. That's where my wife's from, Linda. Uh, drove through a shelf cloud. Hi, Steve. Yeah, drove through a shelf cloud last night, no doubt. Um, and you know what? If, if The cool thing about shelf clouds is you see it, and if you're in that warm air, nothing's really happening yet. And then all of a sudden, boom, you get the gusty winds, you get the rain. So seeing it visually gives you the clue, something's up, something's coming. Um, and that's good because Mother Nature can help get people indoors that way. Can lightning strike and kill people from Danny from Baldwin? Hey, Danny, thanks for joining us. Um, and Jennifer Avery wants to know, can lightning, oh, sorry, Christian, who's age 11, wants to know, can lightning create glass? I think so, because I saw it in a movie once. Wasn't that like Sweet Home Alabama where lightning struck the sand um, and turned the silicate into glass? So I'm going to base my answer on that. But as far as can lightning kill people, it can. Um, to Danny's question, Danny from Baldwin, uh, so it can. Um, it doesn't always. A lot of people get struck by indirect lightning, so it hits maybe a tree and then comes and hits them. And by the time it hits them, it has less energy. Um, but it, it can kill people. Um, it, if it doesn't, it can mess you up a little bit. It messes up the, um, the signals in our brain, the electrical signals that tell like my arm to move up and down. And so sometimes people who are hit by lightning that survive, they have trouble learning how to move again, talk again, uh, walk again. Um, but a lot of times, uh, well not a lot of times, the way lightning hits, uh, whether it be people or a car or a plane, it's called a flash over which means instead of the lightning and all 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit of the bolt going inside my body and hurting the inside, it flashes over my skin and down to the ground because that's what it's trying to do. Uh, it's trying to get to the ground. I'm just in the way. You don't want to be in the way. So it's flashing over me and that's why uh, planes can get hit and it flashes over and around the plane or a car, you can be safe in the car, not necessarily because there's rubber tires, that's not the case, but because it hits the car and then flashes all around, going through the metal, which is a good conductor, 
and then down into the ground. And so if you're sitting in the car and put your hands in your lap, don't touch anything metal, if you can be inside, you wanna be inside a house. But if you can't and you're in a car and you're in a lightning storm, that's not a bad option. You certainly don't wanna be outside. All right, um, let's see here. I had hail, I think it was pea size. A lot of people had that. Um, let's see, Elliot five, how is thunder made? Hey, Elliot, again. Um, so thunder is the sound that lightning makes. Lightning is light, thunder is the sound. So I mentioned lightning is uh, 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that heats up the atmosphere. You go from 70 degrees to 50,000 rapidly. I'm going to a lightning picture. There we go. And what happens is, there's one from Bush Stadium. What happens is that lightning, this one's crazy. Here's a slow-mo lightning too. I'll show you that in a second. What happens is lightning heats the air and it violently expands and it creates um, a sound because air has particles in it. You can't see it, you can't see the air. Um, you, you can't smell it usually, unless like my kids, they pass gas, then you can smell the air, but usually can't smell it. You can't taste it, right? I can't, oh, this is some great air. But there's stuff there. If you go to Six Flags and you go down a roller coaster, what's pushing your hair back or pushing on your face or the dog sticks its head out the window in a car and you know, slobber slopping back? Air. So maybe I can't see it, maybe I can't taste it, but I know there's stuff in it. Those, that stuff, they're gas particles, when they get heated to 50,000 degrees Fahrenheit, it violently expands, they bump into each other and that creates this sound wave that you hear as thunder. Now, sound, just like my voice, the farther away I am, the softer it is, right? So if farther away you are from lightning, eventually that sound might, it's called dampening, it just weakens and fades away and you might never hear thunder. If you see lightning and you don't hear thunder, you're, you're okay, you're safe. If you hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by the next bolt of lightning. All right, um, let's see. We had crazy lightning in Baldwin last night from the currents. Yeah, the thunder caught me by surprise a few times. It was loud too. We had a lot of it. Um, and even after the, the severe threat had passed, there was still some thunder and, and lightning. Um, let's see. Hi, Steve. From uh, Alvy, who's 12 in Belleville, Illinois. Why are there different types of lightning? Lots of different types of lightning. There's ball lightning, which we don't understand a lot. That might be something you can Google, but that's something we don't understand. I'll try to give you some topics to Google and research today too. Um, and there's different colors of lightning. In fact, I think I just saw a question about that. Travis nine, Jocelyn four, what is the light in lightning? Um, so when, uh, when lightning is partly energy being given off and it's partly, let's see, these atoms that are releasing, I have this explanation here for you. Um, these excited atoms releasing light, it's called luminescence and it, it's, bioluminescence is similar to what a lightning bug, bio means like living, so that would be created by a creature. Well, luminescence in this case is created by the uh, electrons uh, jumping from atom to atom and releasing light. So some of this color in the lightning can be due to what's in the air. There could be haze, dust, moisture, and so sometimes that can change the color. Um, but also the temperature. Lightning gets its color from heat. So it, it depends on a few different things, but it's um, excited atoms releasing energy, creating light, which are photons, and depending on how hazy it is, depending on the temperature of the lightning, they can be different colors. You can have like purple lightning, I've seen yellow lightning, very vividly pink lightning, white lightning. Um, white lightning, that's a good band name, isn't it? It might actually be a band or a song. Um, I'm 15, there was, this is from uh, Joseph Miller. I'm 15, there was a shelf cloud in DeSoto and it was scary looking. Yeah, Joseph, um, and we talked about those shelf clouds. It's a good thing. Uh, that it was scary looking because it tells you something's not right. I, I probably should be inside and, and away from windows. It's not necessarily producing a tornado, but it does tell you Mother Nature is bringing something strong your way. A lot of those storms last night were 40 to 50 mile an hour wind gusts. And typically in order to, not always, but typically to get damage, you need to be up around 60 miles an hour. And that's why 58 miles an hour and above makes a severe thunderstorm warning. So the National Weather Service, who issues all the warnings, has to decide based on radar, 
based on data they're getting from storm spotters, storm chasers, from the airports that have anemometers that measure wind. Um, do we think that this storm is producing or can produce 60 mile hour winds or above? If the answer is no, then, and, it, and it's not producing big enough hail, it's not producing a tornado, because those are the only three things that can make a severe thunderstorm, um, then there won't be a warning. And so sometimes you can get a really heavy storm, 40, 45 mile an hour gust, downpour, lots of lightning, pea-sized hail, and there's no warning. That's why. Um, Felix and Lucas wonder how often people are struck by lightning. Um, let's see. Lightning, yes, in the US. So I don't know how often people are struck because you could end up having a lot of people struck but only the ones that get reported are the deaths um so let's see it looks like from 1990 to 2003 i just did a quick google um so that was over a uh 13 year period 12 people in missouri were killed by lightning so it's almost one a year in the state of missouri and it's almost two a year in the state of illinois uh 24. keep in mind in illinois you have a larger population because of Chicago so it gets weighted a little more that way um, so I don't know exactly how many people are struck but we do keep records of, of how many deaths there are Stella who's age eight um, when you were little were you afraid of storms <clears throat> uh, no I don't recall being afraid although that is how a lot of meteorologists start they're afraid of storms and then they learn about storms um, so what what for me it wasn't that I was afraid I want to show you what, what happened with me is I first started uh, in earth science classes because I thought I might like geology. turns out I don't like geology. Um, but I loved looking at stuff like this and thinking, huh, what is that? What's that made of? What's going on? Why is it moving up? Why is it changing? Why is this spreading out? Why is it not going higher? I mean, I was that kid just like, why? Why? And then I started learning why. And I just thought it was so, so cool that you could look at this and know what's happening with the winds, what's happening with the temperatures, what's happening with the moisture in the air. Um, I just thought that was so cool. I learned something in earth science called adiabatic heating and cooling. I know, we love fancy words that make us sound smart, um, and we're not that smart, but uh, adiabatic heating and cooling. So when you take air and you just lift it up, you're not, you're not cooling it, you're not adding heat, you're just lifting it up. Because of the pressure change, it actually cools. And so as you lift air up and it cools the moisture and it condenses into little droplets, boom, you got clouds. I just thought that was fascinating. So for me, it wasn't uh, that I was scared of storms and then went and learned about them. It was more of uh, I was in earth science class and then just became uh, fascinated. Christian, who's age nine, wants to know what the uh, deadliest tornado is. I think I have that slide from last week's quiz. So bear with me for a second. But it is, yeah, I do right here. It's the tri-state tornado. It happened in uh, 1925, March 18th, and Missouri was one of the states, and Illinois was one of the states. So that path is the deadliest tornado in United States history. I want to say like 695 people died. Um, and we, th we think, we're not 100% sure in how long the path was. Uh, scientists have gone back to look at the records and they think it might be as long as 235 miles, but they feel pretty confident, these meteorologists that researched it, that it was on the ground for 151 miles consecutively. So the tri-state tornado, if you were to walk that entire 235 mile damage path, that would take almost three days. But think about how things have changed from 1925. I mean, they didn't have iPhones. Where's my phone? I think I left it upstairs. <laughs> we, they didn't have iPhones. They didn't have satellite. They didn't have radar, let alone Doppler radar. They didn't have meteorologists on TV that could break in at a moment's notice and tell you exactly what's going on, exactly where it's going, and tell people to get to shelter. I mean, all they had really was, they, they might, I don't even know if they had sirens. They might, they probably didn't. They might have had school bells that they would ring in town or church bells um, that was like a warning, but someone would have to see it first. So imagine 1925, you're at school, maybe a lot of people worked outdoors, like on the railroads, you're outdoors working, uh, and all of a sudden the clouds get dark. The clouds get dark all the time. They got dark last night, you know. Um, but instead of a normal thunderstorm, 
this is like a once in a generation, maybe a once in a hundred years type of storm that produces a 150 to 230 mile uh, long tornado. That's crazy to think about. And then think about how advanced we are now. We have iPhones, we have satellite, we have TV, we have radio, we have storm shelters, we have basements, we have sirens, we have so much to help predict, uh, protect us. So don't be scared when you hear those numbers and that deadliest tornado. Just remember, don't be scared, be prepared. Tornadoes happen, and if you have a way to get the warning, and then you have a way to uh, a plan to get to safety, you're going to be a real safe spot. Um, Sierra, who's, uh, did I pronounce that right? To the Gibbs family, Sierra? Yeah, it even says it right there. Sierra, age nine, name is said like Sierra. Hey, I said it right the first time. That's awesome. Um, I've always enjoyed uh, weather, too. Back when I was in seventh grade and took earth science. Yeah, I, lo I love taking earth science. It was our first unit. I'm still very interested in weather to this day. That's, that's kind of how it started with me, too. Um, all right, Sierra, who's age 10, and Rose, five and, five and a half months old. <laughs> now, I think you win. The five and a half, there was a two-year-old down here earlier, but I think the five-and-a-half-month-old uh, wins. All right, here's a, let's get to some, something interesting on tornadoes, because there's a lot of talk about tornadoes. I've talked a lot about radar, too. Hey, from Ham and Jack from the Cases, welcome back. Um, so we talked about tornadoes and I just want to show you that this is how we rate them. So this is the damage scale, EF0 to EF5, um, and this is the estimated wind speed. So we really don't know what the wind speed is on a tornado. So when you, when you hear us say like, ah, oh, it was an EF3 with 150 mile an hour winds, we don't know. We don't know for sure. We've used science to pin down that range. It might have been 145, it might have been 155. But here's the thing, it's all based on damage. So what if you have like the worst tornado we've ever seen in our entire lives over a wheat field? We're not gonna know. Because there's, the damage to that wheat field could be done, the same type of damage could be done by an EF2 tornado, let alone an EF5, you, you just can't tell. You need structures and damage to know how bad it is. So this, the, the rating system, this EF scale is flawed. It's not great. It's the best we got. Um, and it turns out uh, there was the widest tornado on record in El Reno, Oklahoma, uh, at 2.6 miles wide. At first rated an EF5, um, and that's because it was near kind of the epicenter of the National Severe Storms Lab and storm chasers and research. And so there was a Doppler radar on a car, on a, on a truck, that measured it from a distance. And, and it's... Um, assumed wind speed would put it as an EF5. Well, it turns out it didn't do EF5 damage. So now you have this battle like, well, wait a second. If radar is giving us a real good indication, scientific evidence that this is probably 200, 210, 220 mile an hour winds, but the damage only tells us, you know, it was 150 mile an hour winds, what do we rate it? Well, you can't put a radar in every tornado but you can look at the damage from every tornado. So to protect the integrity of the data set, the National Weather Service has stuck with just saying, we're only, only gonna look at damage. We're not gonna change it based on radar data. And so it was downgraded from an EF5 to an EF3. Everyone kind of knows it was faster, but it's a good evidence that it's flawed. Um, Micah asks, what's the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning? Okay, so a watch is when the ingredients for a tornado come together. And I like to think of it as like you're watching with binoculars, you're watching. Not, you're not doing anything, nothing's actually, you're just kind of keeping an eye out, right? This uh, would be an example. Let's say you had, not that, let's say, let's say you had a tornado watch because you know the ingredients are coming together to produce severe weather and storms. It might look like this. There's no tornado in this. There's storms developing. The ingredients might be there but nothing's really happening. We don't have a tornado. So watch as you're watching. A warning, I like to think of it as like, warning, warning, danger, danger, warning, warning. You're doing something, you're actively doing something. This would be a warning, <laughs> right? Warning, warning, danger, danger. Yeah, absolutely, you're running for the basement. But remember, there's also something called a Doppler indicated tornado warning. Now that's still warning, warning, warning. You need to head for safety, danger, danger. But sometimes that can look like this. And this storm is rotating, but there's no tornado. And that's because we 
radar's not perfect. It can't see what's on the ground. So it sees that spin, it gives you the heads up, hey, this might produce a tornado, danger, danger, warning, warning. And last night we had a Doppler indicated tornado warning. Um, I'll go back to this for anyone that might have joined late. This is old radar data from last night. Again, this is old. And you'll see uh, St. Louis is here. This is the radar you're used to looking at. This is the Doppler winds. It lets me see within the storm so I know which direction that the winds are moving. And I'm going to zoom in on what was a tornado warning. And it's right here. See this little nub? What's happening here is winds are rotating right in this area here. So if there was a tornado, it would be south of Highland right about there. So we were on the air with this. Over here on the uh, Doppler wind side, what I saw was real strong winds. The red means winds are going away from the radar. So there could have been straight line wind damage in this location right here. And then just north of there, you have that green, that's raindrops that are going towards the radar. So that told me there was a spin in the atmosphere right here. So if there was a tornado, it would be right there. And then that would be straight line wind damage. That's Highland, Illinois, by the way. So we were on the air with this. Um, I have not heard of any damage, confirmed damage from that. So I don't know that it hit. So what it might have been was radar seeing at 4,000 feet. That's actually literally um, how high the radar beam is above Highland, Illinois. 4,000 feet, it sees spin. But that spin's not on the ground. So it's just one of those storms that's spinning up here. La, 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 spinning, no damage. So that could have been uh, what happened. Again, I haven't had any confirmation. John Scott said, great job enjoying this. Thank you. And Nikki Key wants to know what a tornado emergency is. That's a great question. So this is not a tornado emergency. It, it is a signature on radar that tells us possible tornado. It's not the strongest signature. It's, uh, there's no, in fact, I'm going to get a little geeky on you here. I'm going to go to four boxes, <laughs> bear with me, and uh, <clears throat> correlation coefficient. Okay, so you can't see it here, but I would be looking for debris in the air in this, and there's no signature of that. But I will show you what that looks like. I have a picture, just bear with me. I have like thousands of slides. Here we go. From the Good Friday tornado, get you a little closer. And what you're looking at in the upper left is normal radar. On the right is the Doppler wind, so I know the circulation. The uh, red, red is raindrops that are moving away from the radar. Green is towards the radar, so that's where our tornado and circulation is. Down here, this is a tornado debris signature. And um, it takes some expertise to really know exactly what you're looking at, but that little blue right there in that circle is actually debris wafted into the air. And the radar can see that what's in the air is, is all different shapes and sizes. <clears throat> so instead of raindrops and some hail, it could be pieces of roof, uh, leaves, stuff like that. And so when you have that uh, tornado debris signature, the weather service knows this is a pretty intense storm. It could be EF4, EF5 maybe. It's looking like a real solid signature, a lot of debris lofted very high. The higher the debris lofted, there's some research that says the stronger the tornado potentially. And so they may issue what's called a tornado emergency. Typically, they save that for when they know it's on the ground. And here's why. When you hear me say, hey, there's a tornado warning, it's Doppler indicated, nothing on the ground right now, but I need you to head to the basement. You think, I hope, you think, don't panic. There could be a tornado. Let's find out where it is and figure out if I have to go to the basement, okay? Now, let me try that a different way. This is a tornado emergency. You need to be heading for the basement immediately. If you're in this city, this city, this city, we have a tornado on the ground. It's likely a large and powerful tornado. Again, tornado emergency. Two things, one, my tone, and the second thing is that word emergency separated this particular uh, tornado warning from the kind of weaker one where we weren't sure it was on the ground. It's all an effort to motivate you. It's all about reaching the public and getting people to safety. So we hope you take it serious all the time, but for some of those people who decide, oh, tornado warning, I'm gonna go out on the porch and take a look. When you hear tornado emergency, hopefully you rethink that and you head to the basement. Tornado emergencies are rare. Usually it's when they know it's on the ground and it's not an EF1, EF2, you never really know until the damage is done, but it's usually when they think this could be EF4, EF5 type tornado. All right, great question though. 
Um, Ashley, age 32, I love it. You know, I, I say on the Steve Storm School that it's for kids, but it's for big kids too. Uh, it's for everybody. I, but I just wanna kind of put it out there that um, you know, adults can ask questions too. What's your favorite weather app or radar app uh, that the general public can use? KMOV app, of course. There's a lot on there where they actually redid it and on the radar you can hit um, past, which is like a loop of the radar, and you can hit future. Is it accurate all the time? Of course not, it's like any forecast. But um, it forecasts like 30, 45 minutes ahead of time. And it's just kind of cool to see, well, if you apply a forecast model to the current radar, where is this storm going in the next 30, 40 minutes? So that's really cool. Um, and then there's another one called Radar Scope, which I use a lot. Um, I use some of the more advanced features of it, but it's, it's really, really cool. Uh, Stella, age eight, have you ever been in a tornado or a big storm? Um, never been in a tornado. Uh, thankfully, I don't, I don't really want to be in a tornado. Um, I've been storm chasing and have missed. A lot of storm chasing is eating Funyuns at bad gas stations and driving. Uh, it's not fun. So <laughs> it, 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 the, it's, <clears throat> it's a lot of driving and boredom for sometimes a mini payoff. Um, that mini payoff can be um, experience of a lifetime for some people. Um, but for me, it was a lot of driving and Funyuns and I missed. I've been in big storms before though. I've had um, a storm where my family and I were running to the basement. We had a dog who, who was kind of like Seamus, golden retriever, um, awesome dog. And in the hecticness of the whole family running to the basement, I mean, he freaked out and he bit me. Um, and that dog is, you know, would never hurt a soul, but it was just everybody running to the basement. The trees in the backyard were bending, you know, uh, parallel to the ground. We did end up having roof damage, no tornado, it was straight line wind damage. So I've been in bad storms before. Um, that was in college, actually, when that happened. Um, uh, and by the way, I was fine. I just bled a little bit from my finger and uh, the dog was still the sweetest dog ever could be after that. It was just that craziness of, what, what is this family doing? And they're trying to pick me up and carry me because I was trying to pick him up and carry him to the basement. <laughs> He's like, no, let me go. What's a PDS tornado watch? Particularly dangerous situation. So... Remember, a watch means we're watching for the possibility of a storm. A warning means danger, 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 act now, act now. <clears throat> if you're trying to get the public's attention and take, have them take it serious, hopefully everyone takes it serious. With a warning, you would crank it up to a tornado emergency. With a watch, you would crank it up to a particularly dangerous situation. And that's when you tell people, not only are the ingredients coming together for tornadoes, but long track, meaning on the ground for a long time, violent tornadoes, so EF4, maybe EF5. <clears throat> and hopefully that gets people's attention and makes them take it a little more serious. Ever seen a cow get sucked into the sky? Only in the movie Twister. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, uh, let's see, Jacob Ferguson asked that. Um, let's see, do you question lightning within 100 miles? Sean, who's age 10. So, uh, no, if you're 100 miles away, you're going to be fine. Um, Kind of the extent of how far you can, um, you know, get struck by lightning is if you're about 20, 25 miles away from the storm. Um, let me show you. Let's see if I have a lightning. Uh, bear with me here. I think it was in the, no, I don't have that picture. Darn it. Well, I've got this one. Um, but lightning can strike. Uh, easily 10 miles from a storm. Sometimes as far as 20 to 25 miles from a storm, not 100. If you see lightning and it's in the distance, this happens a lot in the summertime, and you don't hear any thunder, you're fine. Uh, the, the summertime, you can see lightning from like 80 miles away. How is that possible? Isolated storms. It can be like blue skies in St. Louis, but I see a storm that's over Mount Vernon, Illinois, and which is what, 60 miles away. Keep in mind, storms are tall. They're twice the size of Mount Everest. So I'm not seeing the lightning near the ground in Mount Everest or M Mount Vernon. I'm getting my mounts mixed up, uh, Mount Vernon. But I'm seeing high up in the sky in a 60,000 foot tall storm, I'm seeing lightning. I'm never going to hear the thunder from that. And I'm totally safe. And that usually happens in the summertime when you see those isolated storms. Um, other than Good Friday from April Lawrence, other than Good Friday tornadoes or a tornado outbreak that sticks out in your mind, I, I wouldn't call um, this an outbreak, but the New Year's Eve tornado, uh, the New Minden, Illinois EF4 tornado, those are some of the bigger recent ones at least. 
As far as outbreaks go, um, <clears throat> there was one in 2011 in Alabama, and, and I, uh, I went to inspect the damage uh, and saw some, uh, just some bad things. Um, there, there were something like 272 people that died, I think just in the state of Alabama on that day. And that was uh, a generational outbreak. That was an outbreak. Um, I was based near uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, and it, it just, uh, it was, the damage I saw was EF4, by the way, but it was, uh, it was devastating. I, I saw a lot of uh, lives shattered. And um, that was probably one of the, one of the worst uh, damage inspection tours I've been on. Um, let's see here. Uh, Tara, who's age 22, have you ever been in a situation where you're away from home and you have a, a tornado situation? Four years ago, I was in church. Oh, and I was at home. We changed location three times for safety reasons. Yeah, so being in church is actually not ideal. Uh, I mean, in the, um, you know, in the, the main area of the church because it's a widespread roof. Uh, gyms, gymnasiums, widespread roof. Um, box stores, you know, widespread roofs. Those widespread roofs can get peeled off pretty easily. So you don't want to be there. You'd want to head down to, uh, you know, the basement. If they didn't have a basement, think small spaces. Uh, but I've, I don't think I've ever been in a situation where I've been in a tornado warning and either not at home uh, or not at work. <laughs> um, so, you know, if my area is being affected by a tornado, usually I'm at work. Has St. Louis went through a PDS tornado watch uh, from Camus? Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, absolutely. We've had, we had one on the north, northern part of our viewing area. I don't think it touched St. Louis um, and never did produce any tornadoes, but uh, we had one this year. But we've been through them before, absolutely. Stella, age eight, wants to know, uh, how many tornadoes have you been in Oklahoma? So I've seen one in Oklahoma and I've been storm chasing in Oklahoma. I saw some bad damage there too. Um, but uh, I, I was near one, and as it produced a tornado, this storm, it, I actually never saw the tornado because it was out in uh, a territory where you really shouldn't be driving, um, Indian Reservation, and uh, the roads are like clay, I guess. That's what our, our guide, I went with a professional storm chaser. He's like, we don't drive up there. They get wet, we get stuck, and then we're in trouble. Um, all right, let me just uh, get back to the graphics for a second, and... I wanted to show you one more thing. I talked a lot about tornadoes. So here's a storm that's not a tornado. But see that thing on the left? That's the rain shaft. And so the, the two basic important things that you need to know about a storm is the updraft and what goes up must come down, the downdraft. So air going up, kicked up by, could be a cold front hitting warm air or other things that can get the air going up. They create the cloud, the storm, and then boom, you get the rain. Tornado is in the air going up part. So you have an updraft and a downdraft and a thunderstorm, and it's the updraft part that the tornado will develop in. And sometimes they can be rain wrapped where you can't really see it. Uh, so when you look at this, by the way, look over here, there's two tornadoes, twin tornadoes. When you watch this video, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit, Notice the color of the tornado. See how it's changing color? That's because it's air going up. It's sucking dirt, red dirt up. So if that were over water, it'd be more kind of crystal clear. This is from the science out there on YouTube, a great storm chaser who captured this. But just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about storm structure. You have updraft, you have downdraft. The tornado, that's gonna be in the updraft, rotating, rotating updraft. Um, all right. Well, listen, I, what time is it? <laughs> it's almost one I've had so much fun. I usually end these at like one. I've had so much fun guys. Um, hopefully you learned a lot. Maybe you laughed a little, maybe you have some terms that you can go Google and research a little more. Um, maybe mom and dad have heard some things and can ask you, Hey, why don't you research more about clouds. He mentioned cirrus clouds. What's the difference between that and a cumulonimbus cloud? But um, 
I'm going to bow out because I have a news meeting coming up here, but I've had a blast and a lot of fun. Thank you so much for attending. Steve Storm School, you all pass. You all graduate. Have a great day, everybody.